This is the image of Burberry today, one of the world's most successful fashion labels. But Burberry owes its success to a discovery made by this man almost 150 years ago. Thomas Burberry trained as a country draper. In 1856, at the age of 21, he opened this clothing emporium in Winchester Street, Basingstoke. He sold functional garments for farmers and sportsmen. This is the sort of thing that the ordinary working man would have worn out in the fields. It's an agricultural smock, and this would have gone on over his workaday clothing. Then came the big breakthrough. Burberry noticed that the oil from sheep's wool would wear into the front of the smocks and make them waterproof. He found a way of waterproofing, first of all, the yarn, and then of weaving that yarn into a cotton cloth, which he waterproofed again. And that was the foundation of his fortune. He called it gabardine. Sample books were sent by post to wealthy gentlemen who started to place orders for their coats made at Burberry's factory in Basingstoke. Burberry actually sent his son to London to take orders for garments made of the new Wonder waterproof material. And here we've got one of Burberry's early oh, yes. coats made in about 1910. So we're moving towards the outbreak of the Great War. And the War Office commissioned Burberry to make a coat that the officers could wear. And they came up with the trench coat. And of course, half a million of those trench coats were made here in Basingstoke. Absolutely. The great shame is that we don't have one in the collection. It would be really nice to find one that we could use, especially for the anniversary of the First World War next year. This was also the age of adventure. Explorers like Scott, Amundsen and Shackleton were in a race to reach the South Pole. But there was no competition over who would supply their expedition gear. Scott and Shackleton both commissioned Burberry to make them garments to wear to the Antarctic. And of course, this is all gabardine. Shackleton actually posed for Thomas Burberry wearing this sort of kit. In 1919, aviators Alcock and Brown wrote to Burberry after making the first transatlantic flight. Their landing in Ireland was a bit bumpy, but they reported they'd been warm, dry and comfortable. Back in Basingstoke, there'd been plenty of drama too. They show the fire at Burberry's shop in 1905, and you can see the place was just totally devastated. There's very little left. The shop was rebuilt, and the Burberry family empire continued to thrive. Today, that original shop is a cafe, a regular haunt for historian Hannah Williams, who's passionate about Basingstoke's Burberry connection. Oh, yes, this is the factory. I'm rather glad to think that they were so happy in their work. The Burberry girls were always proud to be known as the Burberry girls, and one of them did turn up to the unveiling. We put up 22 plaques around Basingstoke. You have to cherish every little bit. One of the factory workers was Hilda Aplin. In 1922, at the age of 14, she joined Burberry as an apprentice. We did the garment from start to finish for um, seven shillings a job. They were quite expensive. I know uh, if you wore a Burberry, you were somebody. Yes. <laughs> what type of man was Thomas Burberry? What was he like as an employer? Unusually for the time, he was a really kind man. You've got modern lighting going across the ceiling so that the girls working at these workbenches with their sewing machines would have had as good a light as you could get for the time. Thomas Burberry died in 1926. His simple grave in Basingstoke belies his impressive legacy. From the age of empire through the decades that followed, Burberry has evolved. It's weathered knocks to its image and become one of the quintessential British brands. And it all started in Basingstoke. <laughs>